good morning. It's good to see you today. Uh, excited to get the opportunity uh, to share this morning. I'm Daniel, discipleship pastor here at First Baptist, and so what a privilege it is this morning to open God's word together. Before we do, um, I want to share something with you guys uh, that's been going on in my life. Some of you guys know, um, but a little over 14 years ago now, uh, my family and I had the privilege to meet a couple named Scott and Lynn uh, in Knoxville. Tennessee when we were there. That's our hometown, and I was serving at a church there, and they, they moved to Knoxville and, and came there, and they started serving in the student ministry where, where I worked. Um, I had asked them to step in, and that began a 14-year friendship that really turned into just a, a additional mom and dad, really, for me and grandparents for my girls. We've been that close over the years, and um, about a week ago, a little over a week ago now, um, Scott passed away unexpectedly, um, very unexpectedly. And so as soon as the second service is over today, I am jetting out the door and getting on a plane and going to Knoxville to be part of uh, his celebration of life and just to minister to Lynn and, and be there for her. Um, Scott was just an incredibly godly man who's impacted countless students and young men for Christ. He had a career in the military where he poured into men there as well uh, and did did it through the gospel um, as well. And, but something uh, that was just heavy on Scott's heart uh, his whole adult life is that his father uh, didn't know the Lord as Savior. And so, again, Scott passed away uh, a week ago yesterday. And um, on Sunday, the pastor of his church where he grew up went to visit Scott's parents. And Scott gave his heart Scott's dad gave his heart to Jesus Christ on Sunday morning. Just, man, I just wanted to share that with you. Just, just that even in the midst of, of what we would call tragedy, what we would say is just sad, overwhelming situation in grief, that even in the midst of that, the gospel is still changing hearts and lives. And now this, this man who is in his early 90s is now going to be in heaven soon because of the testimony of his son and because of the power of the gospel at work. And I just want to be able to celebrate that and to share that with you, just to know that God is working. And we, in his prayers for many, many years, God answered those prayers. And I just want to be able to celebrate that this morning. Well, we are continuing in a series in the book of Psalms. Uh, this will be our third Psalm that we have looked at, and the Psalms are a collection of about 150 songs. This was the songbook of Israel, and these Psalms, they run the gamut of emotions they, from celebration and joy and adoration and exaltation, but then they go to sorrow and, and grief and, and pain and just feelings of, of being overwhelmed. But here's something that I want us to, to think about, even as we go through this series, looking at the Psalms, and that's this, it's a little bit counterintuitive for us, but here's, here's something I want us to think about, that any of those, when they are brought to the throne of God, are an act of worship. Whether we are in the middle of just a joyous season or whether we are sitting back wondering if we're gonna be able to hold on and survive the season that we're in, we can bring all of those cares, concerns, emotions, all of those things to the throne of God and worship at his feet through those things. And so this morning, we're gonna look at Psalm 73 and see what the Lord has to say to us this morning through that Psalm. And so as has been our pattern through this series, I'm gonna ask you to stand with me in honor and reverence to the word of God. And we are going, I'm gonna read and I want you to follow along. Psalm 73, the psalmist Asaph says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. 
They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Verse 13, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to your word today, we thank you for it. God, we thank you for the truth of it. God, may you now speak to us through your written word. God, may it convict us where we need to be convicted. May it encourage us where we need to be encouraged. May it comfort where we need to be comforted. But God, most of all, God, may it change us. As we look into it, may we not walk away the same, but God, may we leave here today changed from our time today in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. So I got a question for you. Have you ever had or been around someone who had what I call an emotional whiplash moment? I thought I coined that phrase myself, actually, but I looked it up, and it's, it's a phrase already. It's in the Urban Dictionary, actually. But, um, but I kind of have a good bit of experience with emotional whiplash, primarily because I have two teenage daughters in my house. Um, so by, by emotional whiplash moment, it's, it's, this is what I mean by that. You're going along, you're going about your day, and someone has certain emotions, right? Everything's going good. They're happy. Things are great, right? Life is good. They're singing. There's dancing. There's celebration. And then, for no apparent reason, it violently changes to, to the exact Opposite. Have you ever been around, uh, around that? Maybe you've had that, right? Maybe moms and dads in the room, maybe you experienced an emotional whiplash moment this morning with your children getting ready and trying to get here, right? You know, it's, we all experience those or are around people who have those quite often. And really, when we look at Psalm 73, the first two verses, it's really as if the psalmist Asaph has one of those moments. Look at verses one and two with me. Look at what he says. Verse one starts out so great. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, 
right? You can almost hear it. He's, he's not saying maybe God is good to Israel or I hope God will be good to Israel. No, he says it emphatically. God is good, truly good to Israel, to those who have a pure heart. But then verse two, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped. I mean, it's, it's just two different statements, right? I mean, it's, it's emotional whiplash, really. He's, he's celebrating, and then he says, but hey, I just about fell flat on my face and stumbled and came to ruin. Why the change? What affected Asaph so much that he could go from verse one to verse two? Well, we've gotta look at the next few verses because simply stated, what Asaph saw affected him. And so I just want you to, to look at these verses with me, verses three through 12, and I'm just gonna pull out the things that he saw in what he described as the wicked. He turns and he looks toward the people that were not following God, the people who would not have been in that category of verse one, those who were pure in heart. He designated them as the wicked. And look what he saw when he looked at the wicked. Here was his impression of them. Just look at these different words he uses in these verses here. He says they were arrogant. He says they were prosperous. He said they had no pangs until death. They didn't feel it. There was, there was no, there was no, they weren't going through the, those difficulties until, until they died. He says their bodies were fat and sleek. Me too, Asaph, me too. Um, but no, this is a phrase for prosperity, okay? This is a way of saying they were prosperous. They had much wealth. He says they had no troubles, they were not stricken like others. They weren't going through the same things that he felt like he and others were going through. Said so they were proud and violent. Here's another one of those imagery things here about prosperity. He said their eyes were swollen out through fatness. Their hearts overflowed with folly. They, were, they scoffed and they spoke malice. They loftily threatened to oppress others. He categorizes them as enemies of God. He says they have no accountability for their actions. He said, in fact, they live like there is no God. They always seem to be at ease, carefree, going through life. And through it all, he says they just continue to acquire more and more wealth. Let me just ask you, have you ever done that? As you are walking with the Lord, right? Because you know, I'm speaking, you know, I'm speaking to church people, right? I mean, you guys are here at 9 a.m. for a worship service, right? I mean, you're like the cream of the crop here, right? Um, you know, and you know, you're walking with the Lord, you're seeking to live for him and to live a holy life and, and walk with him and pay attention to your actions and your words, your behavior. But are you guilty of looking around, looking over your shoulder? at people who are not doing that, right? You're getting out in the cold on Sunday morning, getting ready to come to church. You look over at your neighbor's driveway and there sits their car that's nicer than your car, right? And their house that's bigger than your house and they're not getting up to go to church, right? They're not trying to walk with the Lord. They're not trying to serve the Lord. They're not having a quiet time. And you think, why do they have it so good, right? I mean, I, my kids, my kids are driving me crazy, right? My, my wife and I, you know, we're constantly having to fight just to, just to maintain a, 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 a civil relationship, right? You know, my bank account, I'm, I'm constantly watching, wondering whether ends are going to meet this month or, right? Or I've got this care, I've got that care. My grandchildren, my, my children who are adults are not, are not living the way I think they should, right? We're looking around, we're thinking of all these cares we have. And we're like, but God, I'm trying to honor you. I'm trying to live for you. And look at these people. They seem to have everything they need without a care in the world, but they don't even give a thought to you. Have you ever been there? You ever done that? If you're honest with yourself, look at what it did to Asaph in that moment when he is living that way. Look at verse two. He says, my feet almost stumbled, right? 
He says, my steps in verse two nearly slipped. So he's just unstable, right? He's just on this, he felt like he was just on this unstable ground as he looked to his right and left at all these people who seemed to have everything going for them, but yet not living for the Lord. Verse three, it caused him to be envious. And if we go on to verse 13, after the list of everything that characterized what he said were the wicked and how they had all this good, even in the midst of their wickedness, it says that he caused him to just be defeated, frustrated, which led to, in verse 14, bitterness. Verse 15, I think it's such an interesting verse. He says, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Do you get this? He's saying, I wanna just give up and just say what I'm feeling, but he's burdened by this responsibility. Well, I can't say it because if I do, it's gonna let a lot of people down, right? So he's burdened just by being an adult and saying, I'm looking around at all these people looking to me, and so I've just gotta keep it in and stay silent. And verse 16 sums it up. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He's tired, heavy hearted, right? Just weary from the burden. And that's kind of what we're looking at all through this series in the Psalms is seeing God, finding God in the messiness of life. You know, even the psalmist here, right? This worship leader in Israel, who knows the truth, verse one, truly God is good. Amen. Truly God is good, but by verse 16, even this worship leader says, I'm exhausted when I look at the world around me and I look at the people around me and I wonder, why do good things happen to bad people? You ever thought that? You ever wondered that? Why do they have it better than me? That's where he was, you know? And if we're honest, here's basically what he's saying. Life's not what? Fair. Say it, it just feels good to get it out, right? Life's not fair. That's what he's screaming. He comes before the Lord in this psalm, and he basically, in the first 16 verses, we could summarize them with that phrase, life's not fair. Which brings me back to my emotional whiplash story that I was thinking about. Um, I have two daughters, and I'm not gonna tell you which one it was that had this experience, but she's the youngest. Um, and um, so, a week or so ago, um, she, she had missed a good bit of school this past semester. She had the flu. We had to travel for a wedding. So she had missed a good bit of school. And she got the great news on a Thursday that she was going to have to go to Saturday school. All right, uh, to make up for, for some of those absences. And so, as you can imagine, she was thrilled by this news, right? Um, that she was gonna have to go spend the morning at school on a Saturday. Well, um, it just so happens that was the week where it got really cold and there was like a 2% chance of some, you know, freezing rain and maybe some snow flurries. Um, and so she, along with most of Bernie ISD, I think was convinced that school was gonna get canceled Thursday and then it didn't. And then they thought, maybe Friday we'll get out of school, right? I mean, they were hanging all their hopes on, on this. Well, Friday morning, I get up. It's a good morning. I'm excited about the day. I get up. I go into their room to wake, uh, to wake my girls up for school. And, and I go over. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I go over to Addie's bed. And, um, and I say, hey, princess, time to get up. Come on. Got to get up. It's time for school. To which I receive this like meltdown. And it, I mean, it's like, it's like zero to meltdown in like 0.5 seconds, okay? I get, no, why? It's not fair. 
I have to go to school on Friday, and I've got to go to school on Saturday, and then I've got church on Sunday. She goes, I don't even get a Sabbath. And then she throws her pillow across the room. I didn't even know she knew the word Sabbath, but apparently she did. And then her pillow goes flying. Avery comes out of the bathroom with like eyes as big as saucers, like what is happening, right? Um, Life's not fair, right? School on Saturday, I mean, that's like the epitome of unfair, right? But have you ever been there? In all seriousness, maybe you're there right now, if you're completely honest. That deep inside of you, just wanting to just well up and find a place to come out. Maybe you'd like to be able to just scream that out and say, life's not fair. I don't understand. But I want you to see the turning point in Asaph's life. Look at verse 17. There's this huge shift in the psalm right here, and I want you to look at it with me. He says, all this was going on in him, in him until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. So we gotta ask again, right? We had to ask it at the beginning of the psalm. We need to ask it again now. Why the change, right? We're, we're gonna see this huge shift in him, in his perspective, in his attitude, What was the change? He says he went into the sanctuary, the dwelling place of God. Why would that have changed so much? What what was it he saw that would have so changed him to be able to say what he says in the second half of the psalm? Well, I think we get a little glimpse of that in scripture in a couple of places of what that sanctuary of God might have looked like. Look with me in Isaiah chapter six. Verse one, Isaiah writes, in the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high, lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. In Revelation chapter four, very similar scene. In chapter four, verse eight, he says, in the four living creatures, each of them with six wings full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Asaph went into the sanctuary. He saw clearly. He clearly saw the Lord, right? And he was reminded of his glory. He's reminded of his majesty and his power, that he's worthy of praise, that he's sovereign. All of those things he has, this encounter with the Lord, And here's the big thing for us to understand. Why set verse 17 is so critical for Asaph and it's so critical for us in a life that just gets messy. Who we see determines what we see. A statement is so true. Who we see determines what we see. What we see, we see it in the life of Asaph, right? He's looking around all over the place. He's going, that's not fair, and that's not fair, and why do the wicked have this, and I don't? And he's just naming it off, having this pity party, throwing this temper tantrum, really. But then he goes into the sanctuary, and his eyes turn to see the Lord. And we see a change, 
Because who we see determines what we see. And look in the following verses. Who he saw affected him. He, he actually now at this point, he sees the reality of the condition of the wicked. Right before he was seeing all this stuff that he thought was so good, but he realizes it's just a facade. Right? It's, it's actually not real what he thinks he's seeing. And so he sees clearly now the condition of the wicked, those are walking away and apart from the Lord. Look at what he says, verse 18. He said, actually, they're really not prosperous and having all this. Their feet, verse 18, were set in slippery places. It says they were made to fall to ruin. Verse 19, they were destroyed in a moment. Verse 19, they're swept away utterly by terrors, right? We kind of get this glimpse. This is actually what their life really looks like. Right, They may put on a, a, a facade and, and, and a show, but honestly, their life is a mess. It's a nightmare apart from the Lord. And then he goes on to say, they're like a phantom. When I, when I did a little digging and looking into that word, basically, this is the idea that God wants us to understand, that these wicked who are walking apart from him all that's really left of them when they die, it's just a bad image. They're not even remembered. It's just, there's no legacy. And he says that is the true condition of these people that he was so envious of. And I think it's so important to understand that for someone apart from the Lord, someone walking without the Lord, without a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is as good as it's ever going to get for them. Right? Here, Asaph thought they had it all going for them, all going, right? They had everything they could need, they could possibly want. Their lives are so rich and full and meaningful. But after his gaze goes toward the Lord, he sees their true condition, and this ought to just strike you. For the person apart from Jesus Christ, this world is as good as it's ever gonna get. And that was what he was so envious of in the first half of the psalm. But his perspective changes, doesn't it? And once he saw the Lord clearly, he saw, the, he saw what he was so envious of clearly, and, it, and, it, and it, had, it was dissatisfying to him. But then look at how it affected him. It caused him to see his own heart. Look at verse 21. He said he was convicted, his soul was embittered, and he was pricked in heart. Verse 22, he was convicted. He says, I was brutish and arrogant. Arrogant, Right, I was ignorant, I was brutish. Toward them, he was convicted of the way, of the way he was perceiving the wicked. And then he says, and ultimately it was a sin against God. He was convicted that that's what he was doing. He was sinning against the Lord. Look at what he says. I was like a beast toward you. God, in my, in my self-pity, right? In, 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 in my moment of wanting to scream, life's not fair. God, why would you do that for them when I've been so faithful to you? He says, that's such a sin of arrogance and pride before the Lord. God, I've been a beast towards you. But then I love the next verse. Look at what it says in verses 23 and 24. He goes on, after, after he sees himself so clearly, after he's seen the Lord clearly, now he's moved to this attitude of humility because he says the Lord was faithful to him, faithful to sustain him, faithful to guide him, and faithful to provide for him. What a change, what a change. When we look at the Psalm up until this point, you can see it, right? When he had the eye location problem, when his eyes were focused on the wrong things, we saw his heart and his attitude and he was just tired and exhausted and overwhelmed. But once his eyes were fixed on the proper thing as a child of God, Look at what his heart began to say in verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
This is the cry of his heart now. His delight is in the Lord. He says, God, I don't need all that stuff, all that stuff that I wanted so badly that I saw all these other people having. I don't need it. God, all I need is you. There's nothing I desire that could compare to you. Whom have I but you, Lord? And you are all that I need. His delight is in the Lord. His eyes got fixed. And now his heart is right with the Lord. How do we get there? Right? That's what this psalm begs us to ask. How do we get there? How do we fix our eye problem? Because if we're honest, we all have it from time to time. How do we fix it? How do we see God clearly in the messiness of life? I believe Jesus gives us a great perspective on how we can delight in him. In a parable he told in Matthew chapter 13. It's one verse, verse 44. We call it the treasure principle. Here's what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. Do you see it? He doesn't just see this treasure and say, all right, I guess I'll go sell everything I've got so I can get this stupid field. No, what does it say? In his joy, right? He's excited to go cash in every bit of his savings and all of his investments and sell it all to get this field because there's a treasure in it that nothing compares to. Church, family, that's how we delight in the Lord is to understand he is more precious than anything that we could ever have that this world offers. In our joy, we, we shouldn't look at it as a sacrifice to say, I'm gonna walk away from these things of the world so that I can have Christ. We should see it as a joy to do so because we know what we gain. It's not what we lose. But how do we do that? How do we find our delight in the Lord? Because life does get messy, right? All that stuff, the rat race that we can jump into, right? It consumes us. It keeps trying to pull us back in, into that crazy cycle of wanting to acquire and accumulate and have our heart fixed on the things of this world. So how do we maintain our heart in the right place to find our joy in him and to delight in him? I want you to consider three things. How do we delight in the, world, in the Lord and find our delight in him so that we can say with the psalmist, nothing compares to you? First of all, it's his word. The way we delight in the Lord is by delighting in his word. Look at Psalm 19, verse 10. He says, more to be desired, talking about the word of God, more to be desired is the word of God than gold even much fine gold, sweeter than the honey, even from the honeycomb, right? Church, if we wanna find our delight in the Lord, we've gotta spend time in his word to understand him, to know him, to see him clearly. If we're not in his word, our delight is going to be chasing after everything that the world throws at us. His word is an anchor and a sure foundation for us. But his word alone is not all that we have to help us delight in him. We can delight in his presence, in prayer, in worship, right? Think Acts chapter 16, verse 25, I think is just such a beautiful picture of this. Paul and Silas, it says, at midnight, were singing and praising God and praying. Do you know where they were when they were doing this in Acts 16, 25? It says the prisoners were listening to them because they were in prison. They had just been beaten. So sitting there bloodied and bruised and in pain at midnight, they're praying and praising God. They long for his presence. Church family, how's your prayer life? How often do you just 
get alone with the Lord and cry out to him and seek his face and, and, and call on him in prayer and pray his word or gather with the body of Christ and pray together. How do we find our delight in the Lord? We find our delight in him in his presence by spending time in his presence. And finally, we find it in his body in this body of believers. That's why in Hebrews, the writer says in, in chapter 10, verse 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. But he says, no, commit to it and even more as we see the day approaching. Why would he call us and admonish us to come together? Because there's power in it. When I see you delighting in the Lord, when I see you seeking the Lord and spending time in his word and in, and in prayer and worshiping the King of Kings and singing songs together and seeking the face of God, it encourages me to do so. It shows me the areas of my life where I'm struggling. And when you see me doing it, it should be a source of encouragement to you. We need the body of believers to help us delight in the Lord. I want you to see in closing how deep the transformation was in the psalmist after he saw the Lord clearly and understood where his delight really should be. Look at what he says in the last two verses. Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And these are powerful verses. Don't miss these last two verses. Don't miss what he's saying here. He sees the true condition of those apart from Christ and his first response is to thank God that he has found refuge in him that his desire is to be near God. He no longer wants the things that he was so envious of at the first of the psalm. Now he says, God, it's good for me to be near you because that's where I'm gonna find delight and joy and satisfaction and fulfillment. It's not in all this other stuff. But can you hear the sorrow in his heart? Not for himself anymore. But now it's for the people he was so envious of. He says, they're so far from you, they're going to perish. So he says, God, let me take refuge in you. Let me be near you, not just so that I can rest and find joy and happiness in my own walk with you, but so that my testimony can be an example to those who don't know you. Church, can I, can I just say this this morning? That one of the reasons our witness in the world is not greater than it is is because our delight in the Lord is not greater than it is. If we truly are delighting in the Lord, it's going to overflow out of us and it's going to affect our witness and how we share Christ with others. So let me ask you this morning, church family, where are your eyes? What are you looking at? Because who you see affects what you see. Do you struggle with discontent, wanting things that just seem to be just out of reach? Do you get up and check your bank account and your investment portfolio in the morning before you open the word of God? Where are your eyes? Because the location of your eyes, the location of my eyes tells me a lot about where my delight is. And where my delight is is where my heart is. And scripture is clear that nothing compares to the Lord, nothing is gonna satisfy like him. Psalm 34 in verse eight, taste and see that the Lord is good. So this morning, as our musicians come, 
I'm going to ask you, would you close your eyes for just a moment? I want you in the quietness of this moment to let the Lord, let his spirit speak to you through his word. Child of God, if you're here today and you would say and confess before the Lord that you are discontent and it's because your eyes have been in the wrong place, can I just say this morning, repent of that. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Who you see determines what you see. Look to Jesus for that source of contentment and delight. And watch how it transforms your mind and your thoughts and your actions and your attitudes and your words. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are in that first part of the psalm. That is you. You're seeking after all the wrong things. You're living your life for yourself without any care or thought for the Lord. Can I say that today is a great day for you to fix your eye location problem. And as the old hymn says, to turn your eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. Because the things of earth, when we do that, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This morning, if you were here and you don't know Jesus, hear the warning of Psalm 73 that it's as good as it's ever gonna get for you unless you bow your knee before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and you confess your sin and you acknowledge that there is nothing you can do to save yourself before a holy God. But Jesus Christ took your sin when he died on the cross and he is offering you forgiveness. He is offering you redemption and all you have to do is bow your knee before him and surrender. Today would be a good day to turn to Jesus. And so this morning, as the band plays and the singers sing, if today is the day you wanna bow your knee before the Lord, we're gonna have counselors here at the front and we would love to help you know how you can trust Jesus as your savior. If you wanna use this altar as a place just to bow before the Lord in prayer and acknowledge before the Lord that maybe you've not been looking at the right things and today you wanna find your delight in him, you are welcome to use these steps for that as well. So if you would stand with me now, let's sing, let's do business with the Lord in these quiet moments.